Zion Church was organized in the latter half of the 19th century by German immigrants from Prussia, Hanover, and Württemberg. They operated as a free congregation, welcoming all Christians. The church served primarily German-speaking Catholic and Protestant immigrants, including Lutherans, Calvinists, and Huguenots. Although the congregation was not officially formed until 1860, the people had been meeting for worship in the modest homes of those German pioneer Christians. The group called itself the United Evangelical Society. On January 1st, 1860, the group met and organized a congregation to be known as Zion German Evangelical Church. They met originally in the Macomb County Courthouse, but on January 28th, 1862, they purchased the Old Academy on Newen Pine Street in Mount Clemens, Michigan. And on September the 11th, 2004, this congregation celebrated 150 years of continuous worship at the same location. This is their story. You know, 166 years ago, this church, this congregation came into being. Many of, you this, many of you know this from your own ancestors who were here at the founding of this church in 1854. People came to this area from Germany and they founded this church. They found Trinity Lutheran Church down the street and Emmanuel Lutheran, Lutheran Church just up the way a bit here. And this happened throughout the Midwest that people came here from Germany so they could be free and own farms and have businesses and so forth. And it's really the American story, not only for Germans, but for every other ethnic group that came here at one time or another. This is such an American story. People came here to be free, to own businesses, to farm, to worship as they please, to, to have freedom and to be at liberty. It is very much a part of who we are as an American people. And so the forebears of this church came here and right here, this is at that time, in 1854, was the Methodist Academy. And the Methodist the trustees of the Methodist Academy sold this property to many of the forebears, many of your forebears. And then the Methodists moved right down the street. And they must have thought Grasher was a better location or something. They moved right down the street. Now at that time, many churches, particularly in this country, had an ethnic base. This was German, Lutherans were German. Methodist people were English, and maybe one or two were Scottish. More of the Scottish people were over at the Presbyterian Church. The Episcopal Church were mostly English people. A lot of the Catholic churches around here were founded by people with French background, although the French Protestants mostly came here. You can go throughout the city of Detroit, you can go throughout, throughout this area and, and throughout the country, and you can see among Catholic churches where the Polish Catholic churches were. You know, particularly in Hamtramck, you can see where a lot of German heritage Catholic churches were, Italian, I mean, Swedish Heart of Mary was Italian. We, they all have an ethnic kind of background, historically. The grotto at Grashen, Six Mile, was German. 
That was true throughout much of American history, that ethnic groups founded their own churches, and so Zion was no different in that regard. Now, of course, over the years, people have married people from other tribes, as it were, and we've all mixed, and it's a little bit different, but that was a common place where people could come together and worship and understand their culture and understand their history and all these kinds of things. These happen throughout this country for white people and black and Hispanic and Asian, all different groups. And so today we remember people who came here and started our church and remember that heritage, which is cultural as well as religious. man asked if I could just offer a welcome, so that's what I'm doing this morning. Welcome to Zion in the Lot. Anyway, uh, again, another sunshiny Sunday. We've been lucky. Of course, it never rains around here, so we have to be prepared anyway. Just a point of reference that up here on the table over here is the offering. And simply, you can put that in there anytime you want. Even interrupting Scott's sermon, come on around and put the offering. <laughs> also, um, this is the last of our current order of uh, outside services because council is going to meet this Tuesday evening and decide what they want to do in the, in the weeks ahead during the summer. So, what will happen is the council will take action, and then. Uh, an email will go out Wednesday morning, maybe even Tuesday night if I get real ambitious. So uh, look for that, and if, if you know someone who can't get to the email, let them know what it says. Good morning. Happy July 4th uh, weekend for you all. It's good to see you all here with us this morning. Uh, today I'm going to be reading from Matthew's Gospel, the 11th chapter, beginning at verse 16. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. We piped to you and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank thee, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hidden these things from the wise and the understanding, and revealed them to the babes. Yea, Father, for such was thy gracious will. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we pray your Holy Spirit to be here upon your church and upon this congregation and all of your churches gathered throughout the world. Be with us as we come to worship you and as we come to celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion. Be with all the people who are trying to assist those who are struggling with COVID and with their families. We thank you for the doctors and nurses and scientists who are caring for us. And we pray that we would heed their wisdom and that we would seek to love one another and to care for one another as best as we can. Now and always we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So this morning we hear in the book of Genesis in this cycle of stories dealing with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, we hear the the story of um, how Isaac gets a wife and how he, he comes to, to marry Rebecca. After the death of Sarah, Abraham sends his man. He sends his man to his kindred to find a wife for his son. It's an arranged marriage. 
Abraham's man finds Rebekah, and he goes up to the well, and he says, well, God, please let the woman who comes here to draw water, please let the woman here come here to draw water. Let this be a sign. Let, let this be the one that will be the right one for my master's son. And so he sees Rebecca, and she comes, and she draws the water, and they have a little conversation and so forth. And that is the sign. So then he takes, he takes a nose ring, puts a nose ring on her, and gives her a bracelet. What a lucky girl. She gets a nose ring and a set of bracelets. And then, of course, we go from there, and we go back to her father's house to Bethuel. Bethuel and Milcah were her parents. Bethuel was the son of Nahor. Nahor is the brother of Abraham. See how family trees get interesting. So they go and they negotiate a little bit, and the father asks his daughter, well, will you go with this man? And she says, yes, I will go. And then they go, and then they go back, and they meet Isaac, and you know the rest of the story. Remember again that these are the stories, these stories that we've been reading in Genesis are the stories of families, of tribes, and of nations. The God of Abraham. Abram believed in God. Abram trusted, trusted in God and was reckoned to him as righteousness. And then God made his covenant with Abraham. He gave a promise to Abraham and said, you'll be the father of nations. And so Abram was renamed Abraham, the father of nations. Abram trusted in God. Sarah trusted in God. Abraham had a child with, when he couldn't have a child with Sarah, he had a child with Sarah's maid, with her slave, Hagar, and that boy was Ishmael. The rabbis tell us that Ishmael would not be the child of promise, but the Ishmaelites, the great nation, would come from Ishmael. The Ishmaelites, and the Muslims revere as their forebearer. But then Abraham and Sarah had a child, and the child of promise was Isaac. And Isaac, after his mother's death, took the wife, Rebekah. And Isaac and Rebekah would have Jacob and Esau. And Esau would be the father of the Edomites. And Jacob would become the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. Jacob will be renamed Israel. So the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. This is the story of families. It's the story of clans. It's the story of nations. And how nations come to be, and particularly how the people of Israel Come to be, and this is what the rabbis are teaching us here this morning. And so, all the family drama and all the drama between the families and all the things that we read about here are not only interesting from a soap opera standpoint, but they're interesting for how a nation comes to be. And the rabbis are telling us again and again that God is faithful, amen. That God is faithful in all times and all places to all people, and that God brings about his purposes through these stories, and particularly through the story of the people of Israel. That is how we have to understand these things, that it's a story of nations and a story of our people. And when we come now into the time of the Christian movement, the time of Jesus, and let alone in our time, we have to ask, who are God's people? Who are God's people? People of promise? people of covenant, that we trust in God and call upon his name, that we are indeed his people if we trust in him, amen? And if we call upon his name and seek to follow him, if we seek to love him and to love our neighbors. Jesus says to us, come to me all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all of you, everyone, regardless of race or ethnicity, regardless of gender or gender identity or politics or anything that is innate or anything that we choose, just come to me. Everyone come to me, all who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. I don't know what burdens you might be carrying, but I suppose that at one time or another in your life you've carried some heavy burdens, am I right? Have you carried heavy burden in your life? Are you carrying a heavy burden right now? Come to me. Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What is the yoke of God? What is the yoke of Christ? But to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. The yoke is is easy and the burden is light. For I am gentle and humble in heart. And in his gentleness and in his humility, you will find rest for your souls. So again, what Christ teaches us is to love God 
with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves, to love our neighbors with everything that we have and everything that we got. You can only love God as much as you love the person that you like the least. Let me say that again. You can only love God as much as you love the person that you like the least. I want you to think about the person that you like the least. Maybe they're here, maybe they've gone on, but you think of the person that you like the least. You can only love God and serve him as well if you love the person that you like the least. That's how much you love God. Take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke upon you, it's easy. Love God. Love God with everything you have, everything you are, and love your neighbor as yourself. There's nothing else to it, it's not rocket science, love God. It's not rocket science. Um, it's easy to understand, but it's hard to do. It's easy to understand. I think the words I said, and we've shared them before many times, it's easy to understand intellectually, but it's hard to do. To love your neighbor, and to love specifically those that you don't want to love. Loving people that you are inclined to love is not so hard. Although sometimes it can be a little difficult, it's not so hard. But loving people that you really would rather not be around, that's kind of difficult. He says you must love those that you don't care for. Love them the way that God loves them. It's easy to understand. There's not a lot of burdens to perform. There's not a lot of rituals that you have to keep or things that you have to do. You just have to love. Because God is love and love is God. You have to walk in love. It takes courage to take up the yoke. It takes courage to take up the yoke of Christ, especially when others would tell you that you should hate or you should seek retribution or you should get even or you should disparage others. It takes courage to love others, especially those that you're not inclined to love. It takes courage to do the right thing. It takes courage to do the loving thing. It takes humility to admit in life that you don't have all the answers. It takes humility in life to admit that you don't even know half of the questions. We don't reward people who don't have answers and solutions. We don't reward people in this life who claim that they don't know things. But what do we really know? I said to Ian the other day, I said to my 13-year-old, you know, and of course, usually he gives me this look, but I said, you know, the truth of it is, the more that I know, the more I know I don't know. Am I right this morning? The more that I learn, the more that I know, the more I know that I don't know. I think it's true for all of us. The more we learn, the more we know that we just don't know. It takes humility. And humility, in turn, gives us gratitude. It takes courage and humility and gratitude. It takes courage and strength to be gentle in the face of evil and indifference. It takes courage and strength to be gentle. From gentleness comes true strength. But we don't reward gentleness or see gentleness as a good thing. We rather have the men and women of action. And there's a time for action and there's a time to act by not acting. Now gentleness in the face of evil is not weakness, nor is it a capitulation to evil. Jesus very dramatically overturned the table of the money changers. We saw how they were preventing people from worshiping. He overturned those tables of the money changers because he got angry. He made a point and then he let it go. He did not meet violence with violence. Jesus never met violence with violence. He met hatred with love. That's the cross. Jesus could have called upon 10,000 angels from his Father to deliver him from the cross, but he went to the cross for the sake of love. Purely for the sake of love. What put Jesus on the cross was hatred. What put Jesus on the cross was indifference. What put Jesus on the cross was bigotry. What put Jesus on the cross was jealousy. All of these kinds of things, then and now, common to the human condition. But Jesus went to the cross for the sake of love. He loved those whom he loved, and he loved those who hated him. He loved them, and he loves you. And he teaches us to seek the way of gentleness and truth. You know, patriotism is something that we celebrate even amidst these difficult times when black men have been murdered in the street, and that's something that needs to change, not only with policing, but with our societal attitudes and the reappraisal of our history, our shared history that we're having. You can't have people of any color, any race, being murdered in the street by police officers. And we also can't have people burning down police stations and businesses. I mean, this is not an either or, this is a both and, but it's going to require honesty and courage to address these issues. But patriotism is more than waving a flag. And patriotism is more than being a sunshine patriot and singing those songs, all of which I like, I like those songs. 
especially like America the Beautiful. I wish we could sing that today. I like America the Beautiful, our, our national anthem, such a lovely song. But patriotism is more than waving a flag or being a sunshine patriot. Patriotism requires courage. Courage to stand up for what is right and what is true and what is honorable. It requires courage. In the Christian context, it requires us standing up for the truth and the beauty of the Ten Commandments and, and loving our God and serving our neighbor, right? Patriotism requires courage to do the right thing and to seek to be the right people, to be loving people. The American people, who we are, is not based upon race or ethnicity because it seeks to include all ethnic backgrounds and all racial backgrounds. The American people is not based upon one religion, even our very nice United Church of Christ background and our evangelical and reformed heritage, which I cherish among with you as I've been engrafting into it as a person of English and Scottish descent. And Ed Bray will tell you I'm mostly Scotch-Irish, but I'm grafted in, I suppose. But nonetheless, we're not based upon race or ethnicity or religion. Being American is presupposed upon an idea. It's presupposed upon an idea about freedom and liberty. It's presupposed upon the idea that all men are created equal. And as we have grown, as we have matured as people, we know that all men means all people. All people are created equal, and that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that's what we celebrate this day, that we have an imperfect union, but we're striving toward a goal. We're striving toward a goal in which we recognize one another as children of God. We're striving toward a goal in which we recognize one another regardless of where we come from or who we are, that we are just as human beings endowed with these rights. We're endowed with these rights from God. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And how you pursue happiness is not necessarily how I pursue happiness. That's just a little aside. My happiness might include, you know, at the age of almost 50, my happiness might include the 50-year uh, anniversary Camaro convertible. It might include that. I don't know. But how we, in a more serious note, how we pursue happiness is not always exactly in the same way, but we respect the right of one another to life and to liberty and pursuing happiness in our own way. And we encourage one another and we support one another in all of these things. That's part of how we go and part of how we witness. Being a patriot requires courage to stand up to people who would deny the humanity of any person, regardless of who he or she is or where they might be. Patriotism requires courage to stand up for the vulnerable in our country and in our world for the poor, for the homeless, and for those who are struggling with finances, for those who are struggling with their mental health. It requires courage to stand up for the people we know who are really having a difficult and a hard time. That's what it means to love God. You only love God as much as you love your neighbor. You can't tell me that you love God if you don't love your neighbor, because if you don't love your neighbor, you don't really care about God. We learned that not from me, we learned that from Jesus. It requires courage to say what we mean and to mean what we say in our witness. It requires courage to build a country where all people belong, regardless of race or ethnicity or gender or gender identity or politics or any other thing, whether innate or chosen. Just as human beings, we matter. As a human being, you matter. And we must stand up for one another, especially those who are having a hard or difficult time. And we must have a standard. And our standard comes to us from the Ten Commandments, and our standard comes to us from Jesus Christ through his crucifixion and his resurrection. Amen? And the standard is a standard of love and service and caring for one another. He went all the way to the cross for you. And he went all the way to the cross for me. We have to go that extra mile with one another. To love one another and to care for one another. So it requires courage as a Christian and courage as an American. And being an American requires humility. Humility to know that we don't know it all, that we don't have all the answers, that we need God and we need Jesus in this land and in this world. And it requires humility to know that even as Americans, we make mistakes, that we're not perfect, but we're working toward a more perfect union. We have a goal of a more perfect union, and we have a goal of loving and caring for one another better each and every day. It requires courage, and it requires humility, and from that humility comes gratitude for being in this great land. Despite all its imperfections, it's a great land of opportunity. May it be a greater and greater land of opportunity for all of our people tomorrow and all of our tomorrows. And also it requires gentleness. 
and this is often overlooked. It requires gentleness, gentleness like that of our Savior, because only in conviction, only with courage, only with humility and gratitude, only in gentleness comes the strength from knowing the peace of Jesus Christ. And only in the gentleness of Christ and knowing his peace do we find the strength to carry on this great American tradition. You know, it says, I can do all things through Jesus Christ, who is my Savior, who strengthens me. God is my strength, and Jesus is my Savior. We've said that many times here in this church. And so what it requires us to be as Christians, it also requires us to be Americans. Courage. Courage to stand up for what is loving and what is true and what is right. Courage to change when we need to change. In the Christian context when we need to repent. In our civil context when we need to change. The courage to change and to be honest about our history. Which is not all good and not all bad. But the courage to change where we need to change. In humility. Humility about our present situation. Being all open and honest and willing to seek the way of God, the way of Christ in all things and being willing to work with other people within our country to build a better future for all of our children. And courage and humility and ultimately gentleness. To be gentle with ourselves, to be gentle with one another, to take our time to work today to make things better, but to take our time to realize that things take great effort and cooperation and time. These are the things I think that it requires to be a covenant people and to be the people of God, to be a Christian people in this land and in this world. And these are the things that I think real patriotism requires. Much more than just waving a flag or wrapping ourselves in a flag once a year, but each and every day choosing to be courageous, to be humble and grateful, and to be gentle, as our Savior taught us so long ago. God's blessings to Zion Church as it begins a new year of ministry, the rich and a wonderful and a good heritage. God's blessing in the United Church of Christ and in all the denominations within the Christianity. God's blessings to the community of Mount Clemens and Macomb County and our city of Detroit and our state and our nation. God's blessings and may God save the United States and may God bring us into a new time where we work together for the betterment of all of our people. Amen. The Lord be with you. Brothers and sisters, on the night in which he was betrayed, we remember that the Lord Jesus took bread. In giving thanks, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, saying to them, This is my body which is broken for you and for all people for the forgiveness of your sins. As often as you eat this bread, do this in memory of me. We also remember when the supper ended, the Lord Jesus took the cup, and he thanks and blessed it, and gave it to his disciples, saying to them, This is my blood of a new and everlasting covenant, which is shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of your sin. As often as you drink from this cup, do this in memory of me. Wherefore, O Father, we, your humble servants, keep this perpetual memorial of the sacrifice your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, made once and for all for the full and complete remission of our sin and the sin of the entire world, the sacrifice which he willingly made upon the cross at Mount Calvary. And we ask you now, O Lord, to send your Holy Spirit over these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be for us the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Send your Holy Spirit as well into our hearts as we receive this sacrament and partake in your grace. Send your Holy Spirit into our hearts that we would live by and with and through your grace, that we'd live for your love, that we would seek to live courageously, that we would seek to live in all things humbly and gratefully, and that we would seek our strength in your gentleness, and that we would see in our own weakness that you are strong and you guide us to a better way, to love you, O Lord, and to follow your Son Jesus in all that we say and we do. And when we get off track, whether it's Christians or Americans, whoever, when we get off track, help us to see that you're calling us back. That you're calling us back to a way of courage, to a way of strength, but to a way of strength that we know through humility and gentleness and love. Help us to love you 
by loving others. We ask all this in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you, Father, and the Holy Spirit, one God now and always. Amen. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the supper of the Lamb. The body of Christ broken for you and for all people. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Gracious Lord, we thank you for these gifts we have received. For in eating this bread and drinking this wine, we receive the redemption of our souls and of our bodies. Bless and watch over your church this day. Bless and watch over the United States and the whole world this day. We ask all this in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you, Father, and the Holy Ghost, one God, now and forever. Amen. Friends, now we're going to share our joys and concerns. So if there's somebody you'd like to pray for, if you want to stand, I think we're, we've got the camera to kind of come over to you to catch you there as best as they can. But if you want to share a joy or concern, just stand in your place and you can you can share it. And we'll, we'll get to you as you come up. And... I'd like to share a joy. Um, 60 years ago, a long time, I met this from the other side of Woodward and after after a couple of years of getting to know each other we got married and my sons one of my sons contacted the church and together they planned a surprise party for us which was last Sunday and uh, even my son uh, David who was Presently working for the city government, uh, state government in Oregon, he was here too. For, so all of our uh, near kin were here, and it was quite a surprise for Sharon and I. And uh, I wanted to share the joy that that brought to us. And in fact, one of my boys contacted the church, and they actually had some greetings from some of you and some, some cards from some of you, and thank you, and uh, I'm not looking for more cards, but uh, <laughs> it was really a nice surprise that, that uh, everybody uh, joining us. We had originally planned the celebration ourselves, Sharon and I did, and it was going to be at Myrtle Beach, but the, the so times have changed, and that was not a very good idea. So uh, this was a really nice surprise. Thank you all of you who helped participate. I would just like to mention um, that my brother-in-law, my sister's husband, Norm, fell again this week and he's had his issues. Quite a while. He could be more, and this time he did fracture a bone in his back. So he's in a lot of pain. He is in the hospital. We're probably going to go Just keep going. John Bain, but he 
opened up, he broke all the ribs in his, in his chest bone, I guess. And he thinks it's 1967. So he, he doesn't have all of his faculties about him. So please, in your prayers, it's Jeff Greaves. Matter of fact, he thinks he's his son's name, Mike, instead of Jeff. So a lot of prayers that go out for him. Thank you. Well, Carl, for you, the west side of Woodward was the right side. That's always a, that's always the right way to go. But we also we want to pray for Jeff, and we also want to remember that in this time, particularly um, with elderly folks, we know are people shut in their homes. Remember, we have to be um, physically distant, but not socially distant. You know, we can always call one another. We need to check in whatever way we can, as best as we can. I mean, all, all of us, we can, we can do that. Let's let's try not to be socially distant, but let's, let's have a new moniker being physically distant. We're physically distant, but let's have some, whatever way we can socialize, let's do that, it's important. Let's come into prayer. Lord Christ, this day we give you thanks for Carl and Sharon, all in celebrating anniversaries. We pray for Jeff and his family. We pray for all of our shut-ins and help us to not be yeah, help us to be physically distant, but not socially distant with them and with others. Help us to reach out to others in love this day and always. We pray for the homeless in our community. We pray for the working poor. We pray for those who are struggling with finances and those who are struggling with drug and alcohol addictions. We pray for those who are out of work because of COVID. We pray for our President Donald and our Governor Gretchen. We pray for all of our leaders, near and far, that you would fill their hearts with courage and you fill their hearts with wisdom and humility. Fill our hearts also as well with gentleness, that we would serve you in all times and in all places. We pray, O oh Lord, for the situation in our country. We pray particularly for George Floyd's family and the families of so many others who have suffered deaths at the hands of police. We also, though, pray for our police and for those who are seeking to serve you. We pray for our military personnel and our firefighters. We pray for all of our, those who are engaged honestly and openly in public safety. Lord Christ, bless and watch over your people this day and be with your church. Be with thine church as it seeks to worship you and serve you here among Clemens and throughout the world. We pray that all this in the name of your Son and our Savior Jesus, who teaches us to make our prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. If you're able, would you please stand for our benediction? The life of faith requires courage. And the life of faith requires humility and gratitude. And the life of faith requires finding strength through gentleness, and finding strength through the gentleness of the Savior Jesus. I think patriotism requires these same things. It requires us to be truly courageous, to stand for what is right, to stand up for those who have no voice for themselves. It requires us to be loving in all things. It requires us to be humble knowing we don't have all the answers, and it's okay to say we don't have all the answers, even know all the questions. It requires gratitude. And above all, it requires finding our strength in gentleness. Gentleness with ourselves and gentleness with one another. 
And when we get off track, it requires us to humbly just seek a better way, to seek a better way through the aid of the Spirit. May we be courageous people, courageous people as we were in 1776, but may we be courageous people today in 2020. May we seek the path of humility and know the blessings of gratitude. And may we seek in all things the gentleness of our Lord Jesus. The blessing of God Almighty this day, the blessing of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you forevermore. Go in peace. And God save the United States. Amen.